Good afternoon. Hello, Tim. Hi, Tim. Warm welcome to you. Um, Tim is going to be uh, joining us from Sydney, and he is the enterprise architect at New South Wales Health Pathology. He will be talking to us about how adaptable digital healthcare is built on uh, well-architected APIs. So um, before I hand over to Tim, just a reminder to the audience, you may ask questions during the talk using the stage chat, and we will have some time at the end for uh, Q&A. So yeah, over to you, Tim. Please uh, share your screen and go ahead. Thanks, Sarah. All right, and thanks everyone for joining me. Um, today, I am going to take you through our journey towards adaptive digital healthcare. And uh, I sort of jazz it up a bit and say that um, it's, it's based on hella good APIs, it's not just uh, well-architected ones. Um, so just before we get started, I wanted to uh, put out an acknowledgement of country. Um, New South Wales Health Pathology acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands in which we work and pay our respects to ancestors, elders past, present, and emerging. We are committed to honouring Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and seas and their rich contribution to a society. And New South Wales Health Pathology is a large public health um, entity. We employ around 5,000 people across New South Wales. Uh, we serve a little bit over 8 million um, citizens. We have around about 140 medical doctors on staff, including microbiologists, chemical pathologists, anatomical pathologists, um, immunologists, and, um, and a range of, of other doctors. We have around 60 laboratories, over 200 collection centers, and have an interesting um, phenomenon, and that is that we, we actually service around about a 70-30 split between public and private sectors. So we, we do actually have a reasonable amount of our customer base uh, in the private sector. We provide a full pathology service caring for anatomical pathology, chemical pathology, um, microbiology, hematology, immunology, transfusion, genomics, and point of care testing. So they're the, the critical sort of um, clinical streams that we uh, we have within New South Wales Health Pathology. And we also have a really interesting integration challenge. So we have five laboratory information systems across the state and it's sort of a product of, of where we've come from as a public um, pathology provider. We have to work with nine electronic medical records internally within the public health system and many more uh, externally within that, that private um, sector. And nine patient administration systems, two point of care middleware systems, and around about 100, uh, 430 existing point to point integrations, which is you know, largely around the legacy that comes with HL7 version two messaging. Um, when we were formed in 2013, we, uh, we didn't bring across any sort of platform or infrastructure team. So we've had to uh, pull that all together fairly quickly. And in fact, uh, a lot of it has been since I started in 2016. So the way that we did um, start the journey is with a roadmap. So we worked with established enterprise goals, um, and that is business goals and business strategy and rationalized the strategic platform. So we're able to look through all of the aspirational um, objectives that we had within the organization. A lot of it are around centralization and offering a truly statewide service. Um, and then figure out what were the, the critical capabilities within our ICT group were required to actually deliver on those strategies. And, and one of the, I guess, recurrent themes was integration and integration platform, but also cloud and um, and was sort of a little bit greenfields there and that we, we didn't have a lot of legacy infrastructure that we were supporting ourselves. So uh, we were able to, uh, I guess, move relatively quickly into the cloud. And, and in fact, um, we're one of the first movers within New South Wales Health to do so. Uh, we also needed to decompose our deliverables into, I guess, elements that could be tackled off in, in relatively short planning cycles. So we, we typically operate on a 12-month sort of operational plan and then a five-year horizon as well for, um, for capital projects and that type of thing. So we needed to be able to split up work um, and have things ready to go uh, when funding did become available and, um, and we, we could progress things rapidly or, uh, or slow them down as, as, um, as capacity allowed us. Uh, to do that, we need to gain an appreciation for our environment. And a, a big part of that is understanding all of the legislation and requirements around uh, managing protected health information and, and ensuring that um, we're able to put in place the right checks and balances to uh, not only, I guess, provide a, a robust service, but also a secure service, which understood 
all of the governance and privacy and assurance requirements associated with that. Um, and we had to place some bets on the future. So it's something that uh, I guess I've encountered a lot of um, trouble with in the past is, is people often agonize over technology. Um, but uh, I think that the best way to deal with that particular trouble is just um, you know, make some informed bets and and um, and double down on them. And in our case, uh, that was on uh, I guess cloud technology in general, but also um, functions as a service uh, and MuleSoft in our in our particular um, circumstance. And I guess it, the Java ecosystem um, as a, as a whole and Fire as well. So betting down on fast health interoperability <laughs> resources is a bit of a mouthful. Um, I guess the, the thing with that is that everything will change. Um, that's inevitable. Uh, so you just have to, you know, keep a ear to the ground and, and make sure that you're able to um, to to pick up and, and adapt as, as change comes because it's definitely coming. Um, we also went out and, and looked for like-minded organisations that we could establish um, uh, good partnerships, and, and we've found that uh, with a range of different vendors, some um, small, some large. I guess the notable ones are probably uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Web Services, and um, and Deloitte Platform Engineering are probably the, the three major uh, collaborators we've had. But we've also worked with uh, some smaller organisations like this, um, who have operations in in, uh, in Melbourne and Sydney. And then we can build that capability internally. So we sort of in 2016, uh, I didn't have any. Uh, I guess group working with me um, and by 2017 we had two people and now uh, I think we're up to I think 16 people within the team and that's sort of a shared DevOps and architecture group that um, that I, I currently run and we've been able to do that and build that team by iteratively delivering and delivering and delivering um, both small and large projects um, from the group. So I thought I'd start the talk a little bit uh, about the evolving cloud architecture and, and I guess the change of drivers that we've seen in, in picking up cloud technology and integration. So it all started with on-premise systems and typically uh, the systems being hosted and operated from the same location in which they were used. The center moved to sort of centralize those systems and in doing that we sort of brought them out of the um, out of the the actual, uh, I guess, physical location where they were and, and put them into a government data center. We realized that particularly in New South Wales pathology, uh, where we didn't have an infrastructure team, uh, we needed to pick up capability from uh, outside the organization. And the logical location was to build that bridge into the cloud and, uh, and be able to leverage the expertise of both Microsoft and Amazon. And the reason we went down both paths is we saw strategically um, there were SaaS offerings and uh, I guess innovations in, in both um, both cloud sort of ecosystems, which were on our roadmap. So things like genomics were more closely tied to um, to, to the, the AWS cloud uh, in partners like Illumina, whereas in Azure uh, we saw that Microsoft had a, a well articulated strategy to to assist in healthcare and and have built out a, a range of different fire based services which. Uh, have been really useful for us to pick up and leverage um, as they become available. So that was all around just managing the existing systems better. Um, so, you know, really just accommodating the existing uh, clinical staff from across New South Wales Health and providing a service which was, you know, more secure, more available and, um, and just, I guess, a faster horses is probably one way of putting it. Uh, what we've seen since we've started this journey is a requirement for us to become more connected with our patients. So being able to connect up uh, patients for active monitoring and um, and I guess alerting and analysis for, for patients in in that uh, healthcare setting, but also extend um, our offering outside of the traditional bricks and mortar sort of tertiary healthcare um, setting and to provide services to places like ambulances. And that's a much more difficult, um, I guess, problem in that it's not your network you're running in, on anymore. You're, you're typically running over a, a cellular or a, an external network um, and uh, and you've, you've got a whole range of different technical problems to solve. Now, with the pandemic, uh, I guess we've realized one more thing, and, and that is that, um, that we need to connect more with our patients 
outside of the healthcare, uh, the, the tertiary healthcare setting or, you know, outside of a hospital or an outpatient clinic altogether. So we've had to do things like set up uh, fever clinics and drive through testing um, settings. And it really crystallized the understanding that when you move to digital business, um, you start talking about digital proximity and digital proximity means that even though you might be next to somebody, if they're both interacting with the same system and the system is hosted, say, in a central location, like a data center or a cloud, um, the digital proximity is really the bandwidth, I guess, between uh, the channel in which that that uh, stakeholder or interactor um, uh, interacts over. And in many cases, almost in every case uh, with, with patients, that's gonna be the internet. Um, so, you know, digital proximity to the cloud is almost always going to be closer um, than the digital proximity that you have to somewhere like a, a government data center or a, you know, very much an on-premise service. So, um, we, we found that uh, we're much more easily able to accommodate that requirement um, by having our, our established capabilities in the cloud. And that also, I guess, moving forward, enabled us to uh, connect and provide our services outside of the hospital and outside of the healthcare setting. So we're able to establish through our, our IIT initiative, a mechanism to be able to um, connect up and deliver pathology results and vital signs over an IIT um, sort of cloud framework and connect that back to our, our backend healthcare systems. I guess what we're also playing with now is um, the ability to pull all that data together in an integration platform and leverage uh, new innovations in machine learning and streaming analytics to be able to uh, add even more value on top of that data. And I guess the exciting thing we see moving forward is those capabilities being pushed out to the edge. And uh, and this is where, you know, aligning with your, your strategic partners and their roadmaps really helps um, to enable a vision of the future. And, um, and, and that's something that's quite exciting for us. So building out the integration layer is uh, is something that we've done with a number of principles we've developed in mind. So for digital, data is the platform. Um, so it's, it's probably the most important asset that you will manage and, and you need to be able to, uh, I guess, govern it and, um, and evolve it to cater for a range of different um, audiences and, and uh, initiatives as they come up and, um, and keeping it, I guess, front and center of your, your ICT strategy is, is really important. Um, we need to design for internet facing. Um, that's a, both an accessibility issue, but also a security issue. So uh, I, I guess we've realized now that, um, that a lot of the threat actors that you're exposed to uh, have ways of, of finding their way through the outer boundaries of, of your ICT security. So um, trying to lock down everything as much as possible and making it as secure, secure as possible, even if it's not uh, externally facing, is, is a good uh, good approach. Uh, you need to design for distributed, and when I mean that, I mean uh, a distributed workforce. So if you look at um, what's happened during the pandemic, you have people geographically located all across the state and they need to be able to collaborate um, easily together. You need to be able to authenticate and identify people outside the enterprise. So coming up with a, a number of identity um, and access management uh, strategies and, and pieces of, of strategic infrastructure and patterns is important. Portability to be able to move solutions both between the cloud and the edge is also important. Um, and proximity uh, is is something to keep in mind as well. So being able to offer that up through your variety of, of CDNs or you know basically having a highly performance solution for all of your consumers is, is good. Logarithmic scale is another important one. So being able to support, um, I guess, uh, exponential growth with logarithmic uh, cost is is a, a, an important element and something that we've learned through the pandemic as well and designed for disruption. So there's absolutely no sure bet that any organization is going to be here in five years time. So you need to make sure that your solution and supply chain is, uh, is, is robust enough to deal with that. So moving on to APIs, um, we're really looking at uh, the API anatomy that we've built out within New South Wales Health Pathology. It's, it's sort of built on um, a mix between the MuleSoft uh, any API-led connectivity approach and Gartner's mediated slash uh, mesh or um, Mesa API sort of architecture. So we have our, our enterprise applications uh, working through to a, a uh, an adapter um, component, and then that interacts with one or more of our process APIs. And, uh, and on the side, we sort of 
refactor out reusable components into platform APIs or platform services, which um, which can support any microservice within the uh, the integration layer. And finally, we we sort of plug on the audience APIs, which enable us to connect up um, a really I guess purpose built uh, set of of APIs to accommodate for a particular audience or application or experience that our users or uh, or stakeholders uh, are requesting, and to sort of you know shrink wrap that around that particular requirement and um, and develop it quickly and iteratively, um, but leveraging the right approach to authentication, the right customer experience, um, and uh, and putting in place uh, I guess the the right sort of of failing and, and support uh, modes around that. Um, and finally, and I guess this shouldn't be ever uh, underestimated, is, is you know the ongoing requirement. If you are talking about data, you're inherently talking about analytics. So you need to have a bridge to your analytics uh, group and your, and your purpose, which doesn't disrupt your transactional workflows. Um, and we've established that uh, through, I guess, a, a mechanism for streaming our uh, our data changes through to a data lake and, and building up our uh, our capability on analytics off of that. So infrastructure is a critical part of it all, and um, and you know you do need to have your messaging, your processing, your orchestration, your hyperscale databases, caching, um, logs, monitoring, all that kind of stuff are, are critical to underpin uh, your data platform, and and you can't really exist without uh, without all of that. Another important realization we've made um, through doing this is that you need to choose the right technology for the each resource operation. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you wrap up a resource with a single technology. So it's not maybe just MuleSoft that you use to provide uh, APIs, but you might also augment or supplement that with some FAS information. Okay, um, so that's, that's functions as a service, but the important part there is that you can keep that as a single data governance structure per resource, um, and that's where the logical component realization comes in. Examples of that are with us, we have uh, adapter APIs for our Cerner PathNet, OzLab, and OmniLad systems, whereas our process APIs, we have an observation patient and billing uh, service, and they look after a set of distinct um, fire resources themselves. Platform APIs, we have auditing user profiles and object storage um, platform APIs and audience APIs for our pandemic solution. Uh, we have an SMS results um, system, an agent portal, which is used by our, our servants, service desk agents, and our pandemic population health portal. And that's something we provide to the Ministry of Health to be able to access and analyze real time um, pandemic results um, and, uh, and respond to them with, with the public health uh, staff. Ideally, um, I guess it'd be great to have those application APIs managed by the application support team. So sort of upskill those groups and to be able to keep um, those APIs in check with the uh, development roadmap of the, the application that they're wrapping. And then have your process and platform APIs managed by your integration competency center and your digital teams look after their respective uh, audience APIs. So sort of have a front end, back end developer um, being able to work on the platform together and uh, and drive that product forward as a single product team and analytics, of course, is a is a slightly different um, uh, skill set typically. In digital healthcare, I guess we built this out through having um, our HL7 traditional sort of interactions with our system APIs, push those through to the process layer and uh, convert them into fire uh, resources, and then uh, then present those out through fire style APIs to our experience um, our experience layer. And the pandemic response, you know, this all materialized in us being able to leverage an existing set of, of assets or um, API components uh, that have popped up on the screen there to then extend that with an initial wave or initial response that we're able to put in place in around about two weeks to provide uh, a text-based result access um, to our pandemic data and then iteratively build on that by adding more and more services to a range of different audiences as they became, uh, I guess, uh, prioritized and, and apparent um, to the organization. So in, um, I guess, some of the results from the, the COVID solution is we've been able to launch the initial solution in two weeks. Our average turnaround over the entire time has been 24 hours, and that's on the basis that we've gone from, you know, maybe a couple of hundred tests a day to now up to 17,000 tests a day just for our organization. 
Um, we've sent over 900,000, and I can say just yesterday we delivered our millionth result. Um, so that's that's a pretty big milestone, and we're uh, enjoying a, an over 84% adoption rate across the state. And all of this has um, materialized a, a three you know, 35,000 clinical days of man effort saved. So this is where traditionally uh, the clinician who ordered a test would be responsible for reporting that back. Uh, to the patient, whereas uh, through our automated system, we're able to, I guess, shortcut that whole um, circumstance without uh, and, and just report those negative results, which make up over 99% of the tests that we perform. Um, we've also extended that out to uh, our IT. So we talked about that just briefly earlier, and um, we're able to very quickly bring online a, a mobile COVID test using our, our IIT gateway um, that we've been able to de develop on the Azure IIT platform. Uh, and then also extended out to our virtual hospital sort of concept that we worked on in conjunction with the University of England. And that's where we're able to actually monitor in real time um, patients up to 400 kilometers away from a base station um, and, uh, and extend, I guess, healthcare to the home and, and uh, connect them up with a, a range of clinicians in a, in a central system. Um, and, and that was again done uh, at a, a very, I guess, low incremental amount of effort on top of um, the, the library of APIs that we previously developed. And finally, I'd just like to thank our partners. So as I said before, we had Microsoft and MuleSoft, AWS and Deloitte all support us um, through the, the pandemic and I guess on many other initiatives. And we've had Siemens and DS um, working with us on uh, establishing an IoT solution for, um, for pathology and, and also for vital signs and, and uh, remote diagnostics and patient monitoring. So, and thanks everyone for listening to my talk. Thank you, Tim. That was very insightful. And um, yeah, great to get a, um, a shout out from you for the Light Platform Engineering team. And um, also, it was really encouraging to hear how not only you have delivered a solution with great speed, but also how um, now there's a potential the potential to drive more innovation since you have the foundations and the processes in place. So I'm sure we will see more um, innovative solutions coming up in the future. Um, we haven't had many, let me just check the questions. Um, yeah, we've got one question. Um, in your opinion, what is the role of the API providers in this vision instead of develop and expose internal functionality using APIs, consumer APIs provided for others? It's a good question. So uh, I think um, I think it, it has to like it says an evolution sort of pattern that that you need to adopt and uh, and you know internal is is the first evolution, but I, I think what we're seeing globally is a uh, you know a trend towards citizen development or you know I guess you know the opening up of APIs to mm -hmm. a, a broader uh, set of people. And I, I'm sure that that will follow into healthcare. So. Um, for example, with our, our mobile app uh, initiative, we established a, a set of digital clinician services, which were tiered or, or you know, essentially assumed that we would have any particular uh, clinician interacting directly uh, with that set of APIs, and we could potentially develop you know, any kind of application or you know, text or voice or any kind of experience offer those, but that they had a full authorization caching, et cetera, model sort of based around, um, you know, the actual clinician and, and, uh, and as a result that, you know, they were universally usable. So I, I think mm -hmm. that the answer is you sort of, you have to start with, with the immediate, um, audience that you can fund and support, but as you grow in maturity, um, you should always think about who's getting value out of those APIs and try and find a path towards exposing that value to them. And, and typically that means opening up to a broader developer community. Okay, yep. And um, did you have to worry about uh, if the data is stored in the cloud when you were implementing these solutions? Uh, what kind of security implement, uh, implications did you have to, you know, uh, what were the challenges that you had to overcome? Sure, and uh, I mean, I think, I think worry is possibly the, <laughs> the wrong word, but I mean, it's, it's something you have to be cognizant of. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I think I mean, you probably worry about storing public health information no matter where it is. And uh, and the um, you know I, I guess what we probably what I found in particular 
uh, through going through the whole process. And we, we had to do a very, I think we spent about 10 months um, doing due diligence on any cloud partner that we were going to store information on uh, or store information with. Um, but we, we were, you know, I think we quickly found that we're more secure using those cloud platforms as long as you use them with the right controls. So it's, it's one of the, I think there's, there's, you know, a way to use the cloud badly and a way to use the, the cloud mm -hmm. properly. And if you use the cloud properly, it's going to be infinitely more secure. Um, than probably any on-premise uh, offering that I could imagine our organization could support. Um, so I think we've been able to pick up and leverage on uh, other initiatives that the government has, has brought around. So the Australian Signals Directorate is the IRAP program, um, and we typically use that as a mechanism for vetting any of the cloud services that we incorporate into our solutions. Um, and uh, and then on, on top of that, we, you know, we do also have a an active and uh, an open dialogue with our cloud vendors to be able to iteratively improve the way that we do pick up um, new technology and offerings that they have. But that, uh, that you know, does also require us in controlling tech diversity as well. So, you know, each time you do pick up a new cloud service, you do need to really, you know, shake it down and understand exactly things like, um, you know, how to manage uh, private endpoints or, you know, service endpoints or private links or whatever you want to call it, but you don't want to make it exposed to the internet. Um, you need to manage your security at rest, your security in uh, transit, all of your logging, monitoring, all of those types of concerns. You sort of have to do a full shakedown on any new cloud service. So if you're picking up Azure Service Bus, if you're picking up uh, DynamoDB, if you're picking up any of these services, you need to fully understand how to operate them in a secure and, uh, and assured fashion. Sure. Great. Um, I think we might have questions uh, a few more minutes. Uh, so, are there any plans to um, share data across different uh, jurisdictions uh, in Australia? I know you're from New South Wales. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that's probably not a question for me, <laughs> but um, I'd say that there is research uh, mm -hmm. implications. So, New South Wales Health Pathology operates uh, the state biobank, and that's where yeah. we um, provide an ability for patients to donate their, their samples and specimens to a centrally sort of manage and catalog, um, you know, set of, of de identified or, you know, ethically managed, um, you know, access to a range of different Australia wide uh, research institutes to be able to perform research on, on the information associated with those, mm -hmm. um, those samples and any pathogens they may comp uh, contain. So, um, you know, that, that's certainly, I think, well established and, and developed and um, and those two biobanks that we operate have, uh, you know, I think had a, a really positive impact on the research uh, community. Okay. So I think one more question from the community we have. Um, so um, just uh, curious to hear how easy or challenging it is to get different stakeholders often with competing offerings, especially big, uh, the EMR, EMRs, uh, to interoperate. How have you found that from experience? Uh, that's always a challenge. Um, I think we're lucky that uh, that the US have taken a really uh, significant lead on interoperability by mandating the uh, the the use of Fire APIs across the EHI EMR sort of marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that's been a, you know a bit of a watershed moment I think for healthcare interoperability and innovation um, by pushing, uh, I guess, the vendors um, in such a large market to be able to embrace and support interoperability. Um, you know, that's that's had a, a significant Im impact on it. I think beyond that, um, we, like, we've like we been able to make HL7.2 work. And the critical part of that is establishing unfiltered or, or universal feeds of information from each of our, our systems and not sort of proliferate um, this point-to-point -point filtered, you know, specialized set of data to come out for a particular purpose. So, for example, with our pandemic feeds, um, they were all sourced from a an existing uh, feed that was used for, uh, I think, the My Health Records sort of initiative. So it was a, a fairly broad um, set of data which which comes through to the the New South Wales Health uh, Enterprise Clinical Repository, and then um, New South Wales Health has built a, a statewide solution for pushing that into my health record. So we were able to leverage that prior investment to be able to uh, you know, build on that for, for this and many other initiatives. 
Okay, excellent. I think we are right on time as well. Uh, so thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's been really interesting and good to hear. Uh, I think uh, we can move on to the next talk on the agenda. Um, we have James Bly talking to us about uh, another exciting topic, uh, topical discussion. It's on uh, open banking. So I'd like to invite James to the stage now. Thank you. Thank you.